my cup runneth over with joy. Makes it easy to pray, sing and shout every day when my cup runneth over with joy. Mine, mine, constantly he's mine while I walk this lonely pilgrim way. Mine, mine, constantly he's mine. Jesus is abiding every day. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. There's a race that I must run, there are victories to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. I want to be more and more like Jesus. I want to be more and more like Him. I want to be more and more like Jesus. I want to be more and more like Him. <clears throat> this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. In the darkest corner, I'm gonna let it shine. In the darkest corner, I'm gonna let it shine. In the darkest corner, I'm gonna let it shine and let it shine and let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine and let it shine and let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm going to let it shine and let it shine and let it shine. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain, free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. Yeah. 
and wait, hoping, trusting ever, till I reach the golden strand, just beyond the
thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. I will trust in you, I will trust in you, let the weak say I am strong in the strength of the I will trust in you, I will trust in you, let the weak say I am strong in the strength of the Lord. If everyone would like to help me sing it, it's a beautiful song, it's great for us to learn. You are my hiding place, you always fill my heart with songs of deliverance. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Trust in you. Let the weak say, I am strong in the strength of the Lord. In the strength of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, praise the Lord. Let's open our Bibles this morning to First Kings. In chapter 13, 1 Kings in chapter 13, and uh, this is a little story of a prophet who was sent of God to on a mission. And uh, have you ever felt that God has sent you on a mission? Have you ever felt that God has had something in your life and something, uh, some direction or something that God wanted you to do? Well, I want to tell you, the Bible says to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And uh, we are to proclaim the gospel of Christ of salvation. Now, here's the thing about this, that we proclaim it with our lips and we proclaim it with our deeds or our conversation, our walk, the way that we walk. And we are just like this prophet. God has sent us to proclaim the great message of salvation. But let's get to this story. And here's an example of how serious the Word of God is and how serious the mission, when God sends you on a mission, remember that God is not just some king of a far-off land, but God is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He's the creator of heaven and earth. And so He's not just some little creature that has declared, okay, well, we've read many stories about kings, haven't we, and about 
those in power and how they have sent people on missions and so on and so forth. But this is the great King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And he sent this man. Behold, there was a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar and to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, Altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born into the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burned upon thee. Wow! Here is the king, Jeroboam, and as he has gone into the temple, so to speak, near the altar, and he goes in there to burn incense, and, uh, and you know, when we go to burn incense, it's like a sacrifice. You're going to burn something as a savor unto the Lord, you know? And uh, so, have you ever uh, uh, done something or, or proclaimed something and said, well, I'm going to do it as unto the Lord? And did you know that when you when you uh, sacrifice something in your life or you proclaim something in your life and you want to live a certain way, did you know that, that if you do it with a just heart and with, and with sincerity and if you really mean business with God, that the Bible tells us that those things go before God, before the throne of God, as a sweet-smelling savor. It's something good. But I have to tell you that in this particular case, of Jeroboam and of those people at that time that that incense went up as a as an odor as a stench before God and did you know that it's the same is true with you and me that if you're not living right and you're not doing the right thing and then you try to live a Christian life you say well I'm going to walk as a Christian outwardly but my life is not right in my heart my right my life is not right in my soul, but I'm going to make people think that I'm living right. I'm going to li live before God as though it's an incense that I'm going to burn before God. Did you know that that goes as a stench before God? It's a great stench to live a, a, a crooked life. And I have to say that nobody's perfect. We all err. We all have some sin in our life that we have to confess and go before God, you know. And uh, God wants us to go before Him. God wants us to ask Him to please forgive me of my sins. Please help me and wash me and cleanse me. Lord, keep me right before You. And the Bible says that God is just. He is willing to forgive our sins, to wash us with His precious blood. But we must make that action. But anything outside of that is a stench. And uh, here, so there was this stench that went up before God. And God sent a man of God and said, Go over there and cry against that altar and tell those people that they have got, that what is I'm going to do? That I'm going to raise up a man, uh, uh, I'm going to raise up a king, and that king is going to go uh, uh, and take the priests who are wicked and take those priests and burn them as a sacrifice on the altar. He's going to burn their bones on the altar. Wow! In verse 3 it says, And he gave the sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. So the altar was there, and so the man of God said, And here's the sign that God is going to do these things, that the altar will be split or broken, and the ashes that are upon the altar will be poured out upon the ground. Verse 4, And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God which had cried against the altar and Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar saying, Lay hold on him. Here we have the conflict of two kings. One is the king of Judah, the, this great king Jeroboam, and the other is the Lord God, the king of the universe. And they come in conflict now. And so God sends his man to the altar of Jeroboam. And Jeroboam says, lay hands on that man. He puts his hand out and says, lay hands on him. And look what happened. 
lay hold of him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it again to himself. Whoa! Something happened. What happened? When you go against the will of God, when you come in conflict with God and you find yourself fighting against God and against the will of God and against the, the, the plan of God, you are in a hard way. You're in trouble. And something is going to happen. God is not a man that, he, that you can, that you can uh, uh, overcome him or, or appease him with, with some, some trivi trivialities in your life. God means business. And here the king who thought he was this great king, Jeroboam, up there making this big uh, 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 display before the people by burning incense on the altar and making everybody think how wonderful he was and how holy he was. Here comes the man of God and says, You're, this is no good over here. And when uh, Jeroboam saw this, he put out his hand, as the Bible says, and he said, lay hold of him. But what happened? All of a sudden... His hand dried up. And his hand, he was unable to pull his hand back. His hand was, there it was. His hand could not come back. See that? You go against God. You make a move against God. What happens? Lay hold of him and his hand, which he had put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it again to himself. Mm. and the altar also was rent that means it broke the altar broke at the same time and the ashes poured from the from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given him so here's two things happening all of a sudden the man of God had made this proclamation the king was probably going to arrest him, throw him in prison. How dare you? How dare you? Don't you know who I am? I think about this sometimes when we have a, a political uh, uh, big uh, 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 elections and we have people who are running for great political offices. Mayor of Syracuse, Governor of New York, President of the United States. Oh boy, important people. Did you know that a man of God or a woman who loves Jesus Christ is more important in the eyes of God than the governor of the, of the state of New York and has more authority, has more power than the President of the United States, more prestigious and a higher calling than do even be the president? The Bible says, don't you know that one day the saints shall judge and rule in the world? <laughs> We're future kings. We are future kings. We belong to the family of God. We belong to the most powerful government in the world. The government of God. Verse 6, And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me again. Whoa! One moment, one moment he was going to have him arrested, and the next moment he says, Wait a minute. Why didn't he call his counselors? Why didn't he call his doctors? Why didn't he call his wise men and say, hey, something wrong with my hand over here? He knew. He knew that he came, went against God and he knew that that was the man of God. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. You see there? The power of God. That God had given this man the mercy, 
Sometimes when somebody reviles us or they, they're against us, instead of us uh, uh, taking a revenge or, or, or thinking that we're better than them, he restored the man's hands. He prayed, say, God restore his hand. And God restored him. In verse 7, Now the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. Now, you know, uh, have you ever been invited to the governor's house or to the White House or someplace? And uh, there are some people in America who are, you know, and they go there like, oh, they get all dressed up. They, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be uh, rewarded now by the president or by the governor or by some great official. Here, uh, what a, what an honor it would have been for this man of God to have gone to the, to the palace, and uh, to uh, uh, maybe tasted from the chalice from the palace. Who knows? <laughs> but the, but the, uh, oh, that was yesterday. Uh, but, uh, but the man of God had another thing that he would command. He was commanded. And look what he says in verse eight. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou would give me half of thy house, I will not go with thee. Neither will I eat bread or drink water in this place. Now listen, verse 9. Look at verse 9. It says, For uh, so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread or drink no water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. You go, the way you came in, go out another way, and don't eat bread, don't drink water, don't do nothing in that country. And so, here in the face of a great honor or a great reward. And some of us, you know, are so easily led about and uh, we uh, 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 will uh, lay the word of God aside for great honor or for great reward. Or to be, to be honored by someone who is dishonorable, we will lay aside the word of God. I see it happen every day in America and throughout the world. We have to remember... We ought to learn from this, that if God has told us thus and thus, we are not to turn from it and do something else. And here the man of God comes right out and tells the king, he says, Your Honor, if you would give me half your house, if you would have given me great rewards, I'm sorry, I cannot go to your house. I can't eat bread in your house. Neither can I drink water in your house. I can't go that way. I'm coming now. I've got to go another way and I've got to leave this place. Because why? Because it's healthy. Why? Because your food's no good. Your reward's no good. Because God's word said I should not do it. Has God told you things that you should not do? Has God told you how you should live? Has God told you where you should go? Has God told you when you should eat? In what place and not in another place? I believe that if you study God's Word, you'll find all those things in the Word of God on how God wants you to live your life and conduct your affairs. And when we move away from the affairs that God has set in line, we get into trouble every time. Verse 10, And he went another way. Isn't that what the Word of God told him? Go another way. So he went another way and returned not the way that he came to Bethel. He didn't go back through that same route. He took a new route. And he went another way. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. And the words which he had spoken unto the king, them they also told to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen which way the man of God had went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. And he went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak tree. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, 
I am. And then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. Now where did this man live? In Bethel. This prophet lived in Bethel. The old prophet. So the old prophet comes to the younger man and he says, Come and eat bread in my home. Verse 16, and he said, I may not return with thee, nor go with thee. Neither will I eat bread or drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of God, thou shalt eat no bread or drink water here, there, uh, nor turn again and go by the way that thou comest. This is the second time that the prophet has told somebody that he can't eat bread in that place, that he can't go to those people. The first time was before the king. And what a great honor it would have been. And the second time before a prophet of God. Boy, wouldn't you like to go to some person who's very famous, maybe an older person. Let me let me see. How about Billy Graham? What if Billy Graham came to you and said, come to my house for dinner, for lunch? Huh? Or some great man of God of old comes to you and says, let's go and eat bread together. Whoa, what an honor. What a privilege. We're going to go eat bread together. But then there's this thing that God said not to eat here. What am I going to do? What a conflict. So when the old prophet said come and eat bread the young man could only repeat the words of God he says I cannot go with you I am confined to the word of God the Bible says that I shall not eat bread nor drink water nor do anything in this place but I must leave I must go <clears throat> so verse 18 now the old prophet says unto him I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the words of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into the house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. It says in the scripture, but he lied to him. Uh-oh. An angel came and told me. You know, you go on the internet on these some of these programs, I get these emails. And some of these emails say that an angel came and told somebody this and that and the other, and that if you do this and that and the other, that you'll get a great blessing. Have you ever got any of those emails like that? Huh? There was a there was a, 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 an evangelist years ago who said that he was led by an angel. An angel came and told him what to do and what to say. You know that there are millions and millions of angels? And did you know that Lucifer was a, a great angel? That's what he is, an angel. And all of the devils... Did you know what they are really? That they are fallen angels? They are angels? Let's be careful of listening to the voice of someone who says, an angel told me. They could be lying to you. And you've already got the word of God. You know what God's word told you. God said, don't eat there. Don't drink there. Don't have anything to do with that. Do your business and get out. But wait, I'm just like you. I'm one of you. Come and have bread with me. An angel told me that I should come and get you. And so he went back with him. Oh, and did eat bread in his house and drank water. Imagine that. He was told by the Lord, don't eat bread there. And then 
he was convinced because the man says, an angel told me. Huh? An angel told me. Verse 20, And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. The word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. Even though he lied, even though he lied, some people say, well, it's a sin to lie, you know. But sometimes God puts a test to us in one way or the other. <clears throat> And it came to pass that they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Forasmuch as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread and drank water in the place of which the Lord said that unto thee, Eat no bread, drink no water, Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. You are not going to die or be buried in the place where your fathers were buried. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled him the ass to wit for the prophet for whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, and when he was gone, when the young man had left, it says that a lion met him on the way and slew him. The Bible tells us that the devil goes around like a roaring lion, seeing whom he can devour. When you get outside of the will of God, when you get outside of the word of God, when you, when you think in your mind, well, I, I, I know what God's word says, but you know what? This looks so good, and I'm hungry, and I've been without food for a while. It won't hurt to have a little, to get out of the, to go away from, to move from. The Bible says that he was gone, a lion met him on the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it, the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that had brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord has delivered him unto the lion, which has tore him and slain him according to the word. <clears throat> when God speaks to you and you move away from the will of God, and you know it isn't, it isn't, you know, the temptation, sometimes the temptation becomes so great. And then it's so easy. And then it seems to, you fit it in with the word. You know, well, uh, well wait a minute, the word says, oh, the word says it like this, so maybe we become like lawyers. You know, we're Christian lawyers, like we're, we're going to uh, lawyer the word of God around. Like we're going to make it look like we're going to be able to do whatever we want to do. And live the kind of life that we want to live. But if you're disobedient to the Word of God, your carcass may end up on a road somewhere. Your soul may end up on the road somewhere where it's not supposed to be. And he spake unto his son, say, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the car. Still there. Nobody moved. It was there as though God had left the lion and the ass there to watch the carcass as a sign to the people. And the lion had not eaten the carcass or torn the ass. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God and laid it upon the ass and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. 
And it came to pass as a, uh, 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 and it came to pass after uh, he had buried him that he spake to his son saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. Let's go to the first or to the uh, uh, New Testament and we'll look in the, in the book of Galatians in chapter 1. Paul the Apostle speaking to the, uh, to the uh, 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 new Christians and here he is speaking to them. And uh, they, these Galatians, had been uh, 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 saved and they had received the Word of God. Just as you and I have received the Word of God, they received the Word of God. And there came in those who were trying to subject them to uh, different teachings and different ideas and to draw them away from the uh, liberty and the, 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 the romance of God and of Christ into a, a position of law and of, of some other type of gospel other than the gospel of Christ. And so Paul writes them this letter. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but of Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galicia. Pray grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, uh, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So here is this introduction where Paul tells these Galatians that God has delivered them. Have you been delivered? Have, have you been bought? Have you been changed? Have you been baptized? Have you been moved away from the old into the new? Verse 6 says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto grace. I'm mar I, I am amazed. I am simply amazed. You've come to know Christ, he says, and so easily it seems that you want to move away from the gospel. The gospel of grace. What is the gospel of grace? What is it? You see, there is a difference between the gospel of grace and the law. The gospel of grace. Grace means unmerited favor. It means that, that you didn't do anything at all. As a matter of fact, you were doing evil. You were living the wrong way. And God sent His Son Jesus to this world to be a sacrifice on the cross, to give His blood so that you and I, while we were in our sin, gave himself that we might have eternal life, that we might be able to have a relationship with God again. And so the gospel of grace is that action of God, that God did this while we were yet sinners, that we didn't do anything to merit what God was doing for us. He called you unto grace of Christ unto another gospel. You were removed to another gospel. Now look at verse 7. Which is not another, but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. You see, we're not talking about Hinduism or Muslim or some other religion or some other way. We're talking about within the structure of of the religion of Christ, the, the belief in Christ, that it has been perverted and it is being perverted. Now in the Old Testament, this story that we read, the man of God, he was a, he was a man of God, Jehovah. And the old man, the old prophet, 
The old prophet, he was a man of God, of Jehovah. He was of old. He was a man of God. So both of them had. But the old man came and perverted something so that the young man was taken in by that perversion. The Bible says that the old man, he lied. He said, an angel said. See? So it was a perversion of the same teaching, of the same God. And so here we have uh, uh, that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8, but though we or an angel, now listen to this, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you other than what we have preached unto you, let him let him be accursed. In other words, that if an angel comes, if an angel comes, if an angel comes and preaches another gospel or perverts the gospel of Christ, if somebody comes and says, well, an angel told me, you know, I got up this morning and I was going to go to church, but an angel came and told me I don't have to go to church anymore. I got, you know, I was, I was going to go and, and uh, uh, do this thing for somebody and help them. And an angel come and said, ah, leave them alone. Don't worry about them. Do this and do that. Be careful when somebody comes and says, an angel told me. It says that, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you other than what we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. In the Greek, that word is anathema. It means a curse unto that thing. Accursed. And I say before, and so I say now again, verse 9, If any man preach any other gospel unto you other than what you have received, let him be accursed. Let it be accursed. Treat him as though he's living under a curse, under the wrath of God. For your own sake, for your own soul, for your own life, for your own family, for your own well-being, do not listen to the voice of an angel, but only listen to the voice of God. Now you say, well, where do we find the things of God? How do I know if I'm following God's word? The Bible says in one place that his word is a lamp unto my feet. Turn the lamp on and walk in the word of God. Huh? Turn the lamp on. The lamp is the word of God. How wonderful it is that we have 66 books in one book here. There's 66 little books. 39 books we have in the Old Testament. 27 books in the New Testament. We have all these wonderful books here, you know. And, uh, and uh, as you begin to read them, you'll find the plan for your life in those books. You'll find the plan for your soul in those books. You'll find happiness in those books. You'll find the joy of the Lord in those books. You'll, buy, you'll find the freedom of the Spirit of God working and living in your life in this book. And you won't have to say, pray and say, send an angel to tell me. Now I'm not saying that God will not send an angel but I would say this, the same that Paul said. Paul said that if an angel comes and brings something different. You see, the angel that comes has to bring the same message that we have. Can't be a different message. All right? <clears throat> God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe. That, that means what you're doing is that you are accepting the words of God in your life. The Bible tells us that Jesus died for our sins. The Bible tells us that we're sinners. The Bible says that we need to come to Him to, to have Him come and live in our life. Some people said, well, where does it say all this? In Revelation chapter 3, it says, uh, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Who's talking? Jesus is. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens up, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. You want Jesus to come and to live with you? 
You want him to sup with you? Have dinner with you, so to speak? Eat bread with you? Huh? Call him in. Ask him to come into your life. And then get on that road that's called a straight and narrow road. Get on that road and stay on that road. And when somebody comes along, you know, and they say, hey, let's go have a drink. Let's go uh, partying. Let's go do this and let's go do that. Say, hey, I am required of the Word of God not to do those things. I'm sorry I can't do them. And they'll come back to you and they'll say, well, yeah, but, you know, uh, uh, a brother so-and-so does it. And, and the pastor does this and the pastor does that. So it's okay for you to do it. Uh-oh. Well, you think in your mind, gee, I can't, I can't hurt. Gee, after all, if so-and-so is doing it, be careful. Be careful. Don't be led astray. Stay in the Word of God. Follow the Word of God. Even though the whole world might say, this is the way you got to do it. If God's Word says something different, you go by God's Word. Amen? Go by the Word of God. And so Paul here is... Uh, is commending these people not to turn away with different teachings away from the Word of God. <clears throat> and verse 9 again, chapter 1 of Galatians, as I said before, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you other than uh, uh, what you have received, let it, him be accursed. Verse 10, for, I do, for do I now persuade men or God or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You cannot please man and God. You cannot please man and God. This prophet wanted to please the old prophet. Some of us, sometimes we want to please somebody. I'll do it just to make them happy. I don't really believe that way, but I do it just to make them feel good. Be careful. Be careful. Your movement is your preaching. And you're preaching another gospel. Be careful of that. Amen. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Let's stand together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. Lord, that you would, in this word we heard, that we must stand in your word. Help us that we might stand in your word. That we And uh, forgive us of our sins, we pray again. And wash us with your precious blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Dismiss this morning. Praise God. Now Jesus is the only